Welcome to season four of my podcast, Between Us, Stories of Unconscious Bias. I've added the title Between Us, as I thought Stories of Unconscious Bias alone was a little too remote. My hope was that the podcast would feature honest and personal stories that raise awareness and educate. Between Us, as a main title, underlines the intimacy while reinforcing the sense of our collective involvement. Since launching it in early May 2020, the world has again changed. George Floyd died, and Black Lives Matter, which had started in 2013, has become more popular and more widely accepted. Identity politics and culture wars have deepened in the UK and the US. Meanwhile, in other countries, people are being marginalized for their religion and beliefs. The need to understand the subject of unconscious bias has taken on ever more meaning and resonance. As always, I am so grateful to all my wonderful speakers who share their often brave stories and allow us to understand the nuances of this very important subject. Thank you for listening. Welcome, listeners. I'm very excited because I'm going to be interviewing Eliza Griswold. Eliza is a contributing writer for The New Yorker, is a poet and journalist who was awarded the 2019 Pulitzer Prize in nonfiction. She's a distinguished writer and resident at New York University and lives between New York and Philadelphia with her husband and son. I know that Eliza is far more than the few words that I've just read out to all of you. And I know that Eliza is going to share some wonderful stories with me. So thank you, Eliza, for sharing your stories and unconscious bias. Oh, Smitha, thank you so much for having me. So um, simple, straightforward question to start with. Unconscious bias. Um, what do you understand by those two simple words? What I understand with unconscious bias is how our, my, because I think it's so important to, for us to own this, how my actions and thoughts are patterned in ways that I'm not even conscious of it, with prejudice, with ideas. We could say prejudice against people, but also just with core ideas that are actually wrong. And I like that. And I think that the, the, the two things that you mentioned, one is the fact that you that you feel that we need to own it. Um, mm. And I think and, and that really is the point of my podcast, so that the more people hear these stories and, and we can all own it. And, and it, we're just human beings. And that's just how it is. And then I love the fact that you're talking about ideas rather than people, because so often when we think of our unconscious bias, it could be some of the headlines that we might think of in terms of showing bias. So I'm very curious to know more about what that really means to you. Could you could you share a story with us? Sure. I mean, I see the way unconscious bias works in my life a lot is that I am patterned by generations of American Protestant Quakerism, basically. So I carry a lot of ideas about hard work, discipline, uh, humility as self-hatred, um, you know, um, sometimes the Australians call it tall poppy syndrome. Never, you never talk about yourself. Um, you know, that, and there are good parts that come of that, but there are bad parts too. Um, and, and a kind of sense of what is virtuous and what is noble as self-abnegation. And when I think about this in my life, you know, I think about how, you know, it's funny, I hadn't even intended to talk about this, but, you know, growing up for me as the child of a pastor, um, the idea in the Episcopal Church, my dad was a priest, and then he went on to become a bishop in Chicago, and then the presiding bishop, which is the head of the Episcopal Church for the United States, and then his boss is the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, and a lot of the thinking that went along with that, it wasn't religious per se. Um, it was cultural. It was, you know, you'd better, you'd better do very well. T to those who much is given, much is expected. That was the foundational idea. So every day was, how am I being of service with the privilege that I've been given? And privilege meaning... Not so much money. I think, you know, for generations, my family had lost most of that, but certainly land like we'd lived on this until my grandmother died. 
we'd lived on the same land um, since before the Revolutionary War. Like my family housed George Washington at a place mm-hmm. called Camp Woods. Um, and then my great, great, great grandfather defeated the Confederacy in the Civil War um, at the Battle of Gettysburg. He led um, the Army of the Potomac, which was the head of the United States, um, George, George Meade. This is fascinating because you're, you're talking about a couple of things here that I, mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. want to pick up on. Yes. So the couple of things that you, you've mentioned, one is about history, uh, yes. ancestry, and going back many generations. Mm-hmm. And the second, of course, because that's just something about unconscious bias too in terms of culture and perhaps ownership of the land. I don't know. I'm just exploring that in my mind. And, and then the white second, yep, yep. And white privilege. And the second, the more obvious one, which you've already stated, is that your father was, was, was a, is a bishop and, and, and mm-hmm. was extremely senior mm-hmm. within, within the church mm-hmm. uh, from, from a perspective of how he was perceived and therefore how his family were perceived. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then in amongst both of those things, there is also what you've just brought up. So I need a little, if you could expand a bit more on, on what you've already brought up, which is about sure. what you call culture. Mm-hmm. Which I, and I like that idea of culture and what that looks like in terms of unconscious bias and behavior purely because of the facts that you've just, just mentioned. Mm-hmm. Sure. So when we look at American history, so I learned a lot when I was writing this book, Amity and Prosperity, um, over, you know, it took about seven years. And Amity and Prosperity is the story of how people in rural Pennsylvania, how rural Americans have come to resent urban Americans, basically, across the country. And what that elitism in, in America looks like and what I what happened in the course of reporting that is I learned a lot about the elitism my family had belonged to for hundreds of years in Philadelphia, which I had always believed to be um, benevolent, right? Oh, the Quakers were good people. Oh, they didn't have slaves. Oh, you know, they were the moral authority. They were very humble. They worked hard. And what I learned in the course of reporting that is some of the darker side of that American Quaker elite that I belong to. And what culturally that had meant is that in the basically 16 and 1700s, when uh, poor Europeans had arrived, and basically more with the 1700s. Um, and this elite Quakers were already established here in Philadelphia. They sent the newly arrived poor white people out to the frontier in in Western Pennsylvania, where Native Americans w- lived, and they used these newly arrived uh, white settlers to fight Native Americans without doing the dirty work themselves. Hmm. And that bred a resentment that continues to this day. Um, and that is, you know, the, the, the white settlers who arrived, like the Quakers called them racist, like the Quakers basically outsourced their dirty work of settling America through people they considered white trash, right? Um, oh, they're so uncouth. Oh, they don't, you know, they, they're poor. They don't they don't do, they don't speak English very well. So all of that elitism that continues to this day, right, that blue state, red state, well, how could, you know, how could these Americans be so racist? Um, Why are they so poorly educated? All of that has roots that are hundreds of years old. And that elite group, which I belong to, has to own its responsibility in the creation of basically people feeling left behind. And and when I started reporting this book, I went out to the town of Amity, Pennsylvania, and I told an old farmer, he asked me where I was from. And I knew that New York City was a terrible answer because obviously who, you know, what rural American likes New York City. But I thought Philadelphia would be a better answer because it's Pennsylvania. Like we were both fellow members of the Commonwealth. And I said, well, I live in New York City, but I'm from Philadelphia. And he said, that's two strikes against you. Uh Oh, 
right? And it was really this history that set me on the course of learning about some of this history of how American Protestantism, which is rooted in these in values of virtue, um, is shot through with racism and classism that plagues this country to this day. That's fascinating. And we're not talking about um, the, the obvious racism between black and white people. We're talking about white amongst white because of class mm -hmm. and because of, of perceived privilege mm -hmm. from, from the first folk who arrived to the second folk who are following through. Um, mm -hmm. And that is as absolutely fascinating. But, but, but then how are you saying that it affects your unconscious biases and what kind of influences does that show on you? So what it has done with me um, is, you know, actually, I think it's had a positive effect in that I am less willing to participate in the BS. Like, I hate the bubble, right? I mean, like, I really, I'm, I push back pretty hard when people talk about, like, well, why did these Americans vote against their own interests? And sort of the easy moralism um, of this political moment, um, you know, where the people, the, the liberal elites are correct, they have the correct the kind of thinking, um, and the rural Americans are wrong and backwards. And, and I reject that in part because I know people well who are not like that, um, but also because I can see and take ownership of my own role, not my personal role in creating that, um, but in my family's role in creating that, and also the ways in which it has harmed me. You know, growing, like I've been to every fancy school there is, right? Princeton, Harvard, all this stuff. And the idea was that these schools were somehow better and that they made you better and, and you should be quietly proud about going to them. Um, and all of those ideas have caused me personally so much harm that I've spent years undoing, but they've caused harm to the larger society. Um, and so I think that because I have had to confront painfully um, some of how privilege can cause harm too, it has helped me to question these ideas earlier and more aggressively than I might have. Is that helpful? That it is extremely helpful, and I'm just wondering if I can ask you a, a personal question. Oh, anything, any, Smitha. Any, any moment, perhaps, an epiphany or something, perhaps when you were 18 years old or 20, or I don't know, I'm just making it up, that you, you suddenly, you know, because growing up, of all of us, we take our growing up for granted. This is our life. Mm -hmm. This is how we are. This is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, you have the wisdom, and you look back and say, oh, you know, I've got to do something about this. So was there any particular experience that? Yes. Yeah. Would you mind sharing? Or just no, I'm, to... I'm happy to share it. And there are probably many of them, you know, I mean, the first that comes to mind is, you know, I am, I don't often talk about it just because it's a principle within um, the recovery program that I'm in that you don't talk about it too much, but I, I've been sober for many years. Um, and so, started struggling with my drinking in college and and the depression born born of it um and i took a class in college that was called theories of transformation and basically what we did is look at how cultures welcomed cultures welcomed and and insisted that adolescents include a period of going to the edge of the society right? Like coming of age rituals, hmm. um, you know, liminal experience. You, you know, you get your period, you have to go live in the hut, you know, you be a warrior. Yeah. You've, you've got to, you are encouraged, you are required to encounter meaning at the edges of society, at, at the edges of civilization. And in America, I think we could probably say the West writ large, um, but certainly American society in the 90s, right? When I was in college, George Bush, there was no welcoming of the edge whatsoever. You stay to the clo as close as you can to the center. The edge mm -hmm. is devalued, right? And so for me, you know, who was, who, who was a child of the edge, you know, I was terrified 
terrified of anything that would set me apart, anything that would make me unusual, um, including my own spirit and soul. And part of my drinking was about that, I think, you know, just escaping the fear of, of individuality, you know. Um, That's very moving. Yes. And, and basically what happened, I mean, what happened after that is pretty, pretty obvious. I got married when I was 23 years old to the loveliest man whose mother was the president of every country club there could be because I was so intent on being a member of the center. You know, I also was in love with him. Like there was no question about that, but I was afraid of my own unusualness. You know, I was a young poet, but I didn't, I couldn't own the edge. I was terrified of being set apart. That marriage blew up by the time I was 27. And I have spent most of my adult life um, at the edges of things. That's what interests me, you know. Um, But I know our culture doesn't welcome that. And I know that that's a product of this very American it's it's what has happened to American culture is it's just gotten shallower and shallower and shallower um, and more of the pack. You just be of the pack. Whatever the pack says is the, is the moral right. And I reject that. And that's a very brave thing to do because it's actually going away from what is perceived to be the right thing or what society expects you to behave like. Uh, and you're saying, no, I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to re- reject that. So could you could you share a story with us on what that looks like and how you have rejected that in your in your life? Sure. From I mean, 27 to now. Any stories? Yeah. Because I know you have plenty. Yeah. I mean, rejecting that quite explicitly meant leaving a marriage, you know, early, um, despite that the pain that that caused. I'm trying to think of a specific story that would. Yeah, you know, when I got divorced, I remember going up before I got divorced to visit with this amazing monk who I love very much, who's like my second dad, and he has since died of cancer. But he lived in Massachusetts um, in this little community that actually overlooks one of T.S. Eliot's um, four quartets, this place called the Dry Salvages. And and off the coast of Massachusetts. And I went up to visit him and to be on retreat to make this sort of decision about divorce. And he said to me, can you accept that your marriage is an error? And I said, no, I can't accept that I would make an error like that. And he's like, what? Because it's so wrong. And he said, but what about error is wrong? It's simply about you know, turning in a different direction. Um, And so much of the American culture around perfectionism um, is about getting it right, acquiring a hierarchical thinking, making it up the ladder, whether that's socioeconomic or market spirituality. We have a lot of this now where it's like sort of I'm most enlightened. It's dreadful. Um, But what he was calling upon me was to own brokenness, own error, not as something to correct, but as something in which divinity lay, right? My path would include this um, because I was human. And and that was a different kind of thinking for me um, that opened up a lot of freedom and really helped me begin to deconstruct some of what I carry um, intergenerationally. But but I would be remiss, Smitha, not to talk about, you know, the role I have to, the work that I'm doing now around um, unconscious bias is around white privilege, right? Because like none of this can be divorced from race. Yes, it it's like it's so elite that it's white on white. That is absolutely true. Hmm. But the intentionality around um, the construct of whiteness and of hierarchy within whiteness is something that I live kind of at the apex of. Right. Um, so I am just beginning to own and do the work which I don't, I mean, a lot of unconscious bias, I think, is also just blindness, 
right? That's in the unconsciousness. So mm-hmm. learning to be conscious and then take ownership about where, where does white privilege benefit me and how then once I see it, how can I have the confidence to undo it? it it's a lot easier to be like, I know it's, it's in me and I, and sure. so, But then my question yeah. is, because yeah. th- there's something that we all need to, to appreciate. What do you personally understand by these two words, white privilege? Because I, does it mean the same thing to everyone? Or perhaps no, it doesn't. It so what does it mean doesn't. to you? To me, it means, see, the, and this gets tricky because this is, I don't think this is very popular to say what I'm saying now. To me, it also means owning the harm that these ideas have caused me, right? Because that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a little girl who was raised in a culture in which fucking up was on her entirely because every single privilege had been given to that child. And she knew that if she didn't make good, she didn't win the Pulitzer Prize. She didn't write for the New Yorker. Then it, she had screwed it up because every way had been set for her to do that culturally. Um, and that is extremely harmful, you know? Um, and so in doing this work, you know, I like in trying to, you know, I hate mob speak, whatever that is. I don't like easy moralism, you know? So when I feel like people are throwing around terms without looking at them themselves, I don't like it, you know? Um, And I think what I particularly like about what you've said about white privilege, because I think especially this year, so many people are talking about, especially white male privilege, you know, if you happen to be white and you happen to be a man, uh, then there's very little that you can do right is what people suggest sometimes. Yeah. But what you're saying is we're not doing right to ourselves to begin yeah. with because right. of our unconscious biases around what we take for granted as our white privilege. And then, of course, uh, yeah. there is the obvious one that people yeah. read about and know about and discuss and explore, which is about I am white and I have privilege and without my realizing it, I'm unconsciously are being unfair to you because you don't have the same. That's an mm-hmm. obvious one, but, the, but mm-hmm. your, your explanation is far more nuanced. And that, I think, is very important for us to appreciate. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, so, well, I'm, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. It's, I mean, it's difficult stuff, right? And it, I mean, that it's, it, that's such a cliche, but even to own it, like, even in talking, I, I'm like, oh, gosh, what have I said? I, I hope. Even what I'm saying now, this is a journey, right? Like I know mm. that owning, owning the way that society has patterned me and taking responsibility for it is not, it's not nearly finished. And so part of that process has to do with having the courage to speak in a way that is of course going to include fuck ups. Do you know what I mean? Like, of course it is. Um, because that's the process of learning. And, and where I really wish we could do better is in allowing one another to make mistakes. This whole cancel culture just, it makes me furious. Um, and it's so trendy. I just, I really don't like political trend, whatever it is. I'm suspicious of it. And I think that's because of your learning and your reflection on your own experiences call it privilege or call it anything else um Mm. but but those experiences and how they've shaped you but but could you perhaps um because i know that 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 other than and writing about amity and prosperity and uh, and exploring what you are at the moment in the united states you've done all kinds of other journalism are there other stories that perhaps another story you could share with us um that has shown you aspects of unconscious bias Yeah. I mean, well, one thing, I mean, what I can share is also difficult moral moments in journalism that can contain unconscious bias. Like I remember Mm -hmm. being up, you know, um, a few years ago when Seamus Murphy and I did this book um, about Afghan women's poetry and we were collecting and and documenting poems for women who are largely illiterate. Um, and in many cases really didn't want to, they didn't want to be recorded. Right. So, and, and often that would look like, 
I would be sitting with a group of women and they would take my phone um, and put it under the pillows in a room to indicate to me that they didn't want me to record their voices, which was perfectly fine. But when that book came out, I remember being up at Harvard um, and giving a lecture and getting a furious question from a woman in the audience who said, you know, don't you think that Afghan women could have translated these poems for themselves, right? There are enough English speaking Afghan women. Why are you out there collecting these poems? And I said, you know what? Because you think that the magazine that published these would have wanted it if it weren't like, if I didn't do it, like partly we need to own how that works, right? The interlocutor going to collect them, like as Orientalist as it can be, is also a device which allows those poems to come into English, right? Mm -hmm. And that was not a popular answer, right? Like it was, the person was even angrier, right? Because, but that is what owning privilege looks like, right? Like the privilege of the construction of self that I have allowed those poems to come into English because there was somebody who was saying, I want to go collect them. I can do it. Do you know what I'm saying? And that Absolutely. is super uncomfortable. Because these two know? words, cultural appropriation, are used a lot these days. Um, yes. You know, along with things like white privilege. And, and I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, you can be black and write about white people. You can be white and write about black people. Or you can be... The whole idea of being creative and sharing stories is, is about going into other cultures and acknowledging and learning and reading. And then if you had the opportunity, you personally have the opportunity to be published in X magazine, whereas I don't, then why can't I share my story with you for some other people to read it and, and learn from it? But so, it is, a, it is yeah. a debate, a long lasting debate that it's a lot a of long people are talking debate. about. It is. And so two things to that. One is that, you know, as a teacher of journalism as a professor the most important lesson that i bring to that classroom is that reporting requires crossing lines of difference right? right exactly what you're saying you cannot we cannot say that well so if you don't want to cross lines of difference write a memoir but we must be able to teach and practice speaking to people who are different than we are. That is what reporting is. You know, so when I teach counter to the kind of dominant ethics of these times, which is, right, like who dares to speak for someone else, there is another ethic involved, which is that stories deserve to be heard. And there is an ethical call to tell them of, of other people. So that is super important to me. Um, just to make clear, because I think that to 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 act as if there's like there have been no ethics before now. Right. Or or all the new thinking is virtuous um, and the old is corrupt by 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 virtue of being associated with white privilege um, and imperialism isn't right. We need to interrogate more finally than that. And I and I feel like not enough of us do. Do you know? Um, and the other thing is, Smith, the story that comes to mind about this is not long ago at the Jaipur Literary Festival, itself, right, a questionable <laughs> endeavor, um, I was sitting on stage with a bunch of war correspondents from the, like, from the 2000s, right? Like, it was Sam Kiley, me, Steve, um, and a couple of other people, right? Most of us were white. Most of us were English or American. And somebody asked, you know, well, why are you the people telling stories? And the truth is, we aren't anymore. Like when I think about the best reporting coming out of Syria, I think of native um, Arabic speakers. I think of Rania Abuzaid um, and others who, who can do the work and are doing the work and now have the contacts with the long form journalism, whatever. So it was an era and it's an era that's ending, thank God. Um, but we don't need to damn everyone who did it because it no. was a it was a bridge time, you know? Mm. 
And it's 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 about you know um, someone mentioned to me about a pendulum swinging left or towards at some point and then it swung far right and at some point it'll come back into the center and that's what this is about and it's about not right and wrong but about different nuances and different ways of seeing the world and the idea of what you're saying about sharing stories because all of us are not just one aspect of us no. we ourselves exactly have so many stories so if i if i accept you as just this white privileged american multi you know many generations first american you know came with 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 you know whichever ship that landed there in you know the east <laughs> coast of america yeah. and that's who you are and that's it but of course that's right. not it and you are so much more than that so it's about us understanding the world in many different ways as by sharing stories so but so eliza i mean this is amazing but you've done a lot of reflection clearly so what kind of you know what kind of life lessons do you give yourself how do you manage your unconscious biases well i try to i mean it, particularly with relate rel- related to race right now cuz that's where they're up a lot i try to listen to i have the privilege of being part of like a group i get to listen to other african american uh, there're a couple of doctors who are talking about how crappy their white colleagues are around um like George Floyd or not as much George Floyd himself but moments when black people are killed by the police somewhere in the country and how angry it makes them that their white colleagues don't say to them you know i'm so sorry about x y or z and you know that is a revelation to me and i've said to them i'm like you know i don't i wouldn't say that to my black colleagues at nyu because i would assume that might be harmful like to associate that any death of any black person in america they're supposed to take personally mm. you know like i can understand avoiding the subject not yes because i'm not thinking about it cuz i have the privilege not to think about it but also because why would they want to be implicated by that event somewhere you know in seattle mm. and listening to them talk about about what it means to be an ally which is another word that i think can be really problematic but i'm trying mm-hmm. to see what it means to me right i am learning to be a better i hope a better colleague at nyu and what that means in specific ways is to do the crappy jobs like to call my colleagues of color who are often like stuck doing all the crappy boring scut work right that goes along with like okay what does diversity really mean in x y or z and just putting my hand up more um to participate in things that i don't feel implicated in because i am implicated in them um so that i guess for me right now that's the that's like that's like on the front burner you know mm-hmm. um and on the back burner always is trying you know i'm a mom right i have a 7 mm-hmm. year old child and I know like I look at the lack of diversity in his private school um you know I I wonder like am I supposed to be deliberate more deliberate with making sure he has you know more diverse friends is that tokenism like these are live questions and I think the more we talk about them and risk talking about them the better um but it's not it takes a lot of courage because you also i mean i get slammed sometimes and i have to be able to hold that without getting reactive and i'm not great at that you know because i feel like by making an effort we earn some space to not be called out i don't i don't like that calling out very much at all no i think that's so yeah. wonderful because you're you're very brave and you're extremely honest and if i would just summarize whether it's the front burner or the back burner what you're just saying is can i please have honest open conversation uh whatever it might be about and i'm willing to learn and i'm learning all the time and that's really that's pretty much it um you've given us two specific examples but that's what we all have to do isn't it just speak honestly and say oh, i didn't know that um and i'm sorry if i offended you or i didn't offend you or let's explore and let's discuss openly and honestly and that's what you're doing and i think that's fantastic I love oh, it. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank no, you. No, seriously. Thank you so much Eliza. Eliza Griswold, I've so enjoyed hearing your stories. I could go on forever. 
Um, but I think your seven-year-old might require you. I can hear him in the background. <laughs> so, so thank you so very much for your time and sharing thank your you stories. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to my podcast, Between Us, Stories of Unconscious Bias. I'm Smitha Tharoor. If you like this episode, please do share with a friend or colleague. It's only by sharing that more people will know of it. You can find out about previous episodes and the next ones by following me on Twitter or Instagram at Smitha Tharoor. The next episode will be in a week's time.